Welcome to Salisbury University on the Air, a program highlighting the activities and the people of the campus. I'm your host, Susan Purnell. Salisbury University has a long tradition of partnering with the greater community through numerous campus-wide community engagement events, like the big event, I Love Salisbury, and more. But did you know that each of the schools and colleges at SU have their own areas and they connect with community members on a regular basis? Today, we'll discuss one of those schools, the Charles R. and Martha N. Fulton School of Liberal Arts and its efforts in the community. Here to talk about those connections is Dr. Martin Paraboom, Dean of the Fulton School. Good morning, Martin. Thank you for being here. Hi, Susan. Great to be here. Great to see you again. So, when people hear the words liberal arts, I think there's a lot of questions. What does that really mean? So, I guess that's my first question along with, and what is the importance of a liberal arts education? Well, a liberal arts education really offers students the opportunity, as young adults, to uh, embrace the opportunity that lies before them, especially in a free, liberal society. Uh, in other words, it's a great opportunity for them to think about personal growth, but beyond that, their professional formation and their role as citizens. And so what we do is give them access to all kinds of great courses and programs that allow them to explore their interests, uh, but to set a course for their adult lives and to develop those skills that will really be foundational to their success as adults. So you think about the academic things like research, analysis, communication skills, which mm -hmm. are so super important. But beyond that, leadership, um, team building, uh, being a good team member, creativity, uh, just being aware of what's happening in the world in terms of our democracy and our culture, and just being able to be a thoughtful, participating citizen in that world. Thanks. Teaches you to think teaches you to think and think independently, mm -hmm. uh, but also to think in a way that's responsible and grounded in, in science um, and, and, and reason. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Now, I'm sure when many people think about the Fulton School, they think about the Bobby Byron Performing Arts Center. I certainly do. And I know with COVID, there have been some hurdles to overcome. Tell me a little bit about how that's been in this environment. Yeah, well, and I, I really have to hand it to my colleagues in the performing arts uh, because they got socked, of course, with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Everything shut down in terms of any kind of live performance and even the kind of activities that are sort of foundational to those programs in the performing arts. Uh, that involves proximity, right, and right. physical contact. And so that was all off the table. And so they really had to rally and rally quickly, and they did. Uh, to, to look at alternative ways of, of instructing students, uh, to working together, mm -hmm. uh, and, and putting performances online uh, via streaming. So we've learned a whole lot about that. Uh, so that's where that creativity piece uh, that yeah. the arts, of course, are so important for uh, really came into play. And a new skill set. Now everybody knows how to do <laughs> streaming, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We've all become more technical than we were anyway, right? Yes, and more patient. <laughs> and more patient. <laughs> Fulton School students contribute in so many ways, and I know their uh, work is on display all over the place, um, be it sculptures, glass blowing, paintings. Tell us where we can find some of the, the products of their work. Yeah, well, we have two gallery spaces, so I would start with that. The University Gallery is in Fulton Hall, and that soon will be featuring uh, work from our seniors, as it does every spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, we have the downtown gallery space uh, in the building that uh, was so generously donated to the university a few years ago. We have a beautiful state-of-the-art uh, facility there. That is. Yep, and that's just upstairs beautiful. from Salisbury Art Space, right. which we also support in that space. Mm -hmm. So uh, downtown is really becoming a lively arts and entertainment district. Uh, so those two spaces are open, um, and you can visit those now to see uh, artwork on, on exhibit. Uh, so those are the typical spaces, but then you'll also see student work elsewhere. Um, I would note with some uh, a special uh, pride, uh, Hannah Gordon's uh, mural, SU is Us, uh, which she did uh, was her response working with a group of her colleagues uh, in Fulton Hall in the South Open Staircase. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful mural that was, was a, a, an expression of, of unity and solidarity and appreciation for 
all of the diversity that makes up the SU student and faculty community. I haven't seen community. that. I have to check that out. It's really nice. Yeah. So next time you stroll th through Absolutely. campus, come through Fulton Hall and I it's do beautiful stroll piece. through campus a lot now <laughs> that I'm on campus. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, now I understand that the some of the artists' um, skills were used to make uh, protective equipment during COVID. How did that, what was that all about? Yeah, in the early stages, I would cite in particular uh, Bill Wolf, who is our sculpture professor, uh, worked with some colleagues, including Josh Killen, to develop some um, working with plexiglass, because they make stuff, right? And, mm -hmm. and so the creativity that goes into making 3D art, the same skills that go into making uh, equipment and even experimental equipment. Uh, so they were working early on with colleagues at uh, Tidal Health. I think it was, I don't know if it was called Tidal Health yet then, the name mm -hmm. change was just getting underway, uh, to, to kind of work on some uh, potential pieces for, uh, for ventilators. Um, like, oh. so, sort of thinking creatively, right, and outside the box right. to create what in fact were plexiglass boxes to, um, to, to address, you know, at the, in those early stages again, when we knew so little about the disease, the kind of things that we would need to, um, to help those who were, who were really suffering from the disease. Oh, that's wonderful use of their talents. Um, going back to the large performances, the music performances, like the symphony, the choirs, that sort of thing, how have those performances been uh, allowed to happen here on campus? Right, pretty much only virtually, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, choral uh, performance because of the particular risks associated with yeah. you know that many people, and then breathing together. Yes, and exhaling, yes. and uh, and and even since the beginning of the pandemic, we've learned about sort of variations among different voices and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the upshot of it was that we really couldn't do choral performance. Choral. It was too many people in one space, yeah. and just with the. The early um, news reports that we'd gotten about that church, for example, in, in the That's Seattle right. area. Mm -hmm. uh, so the risk there was too great. Uh, the, the other ensembles have continued. And so Ali Nair's um, uh, uh, concert band mm -hmm. and the jazz ensemble and the symphony have continued to work predominantly with students. Normally those are great opportunities for community, community members right. exactly to, to participate as well. And that's such a great exchange between students and, and uh, members of the community. Uh, that we had to curtail, of course, again, in the interest of de-densifying and, and working with smaller groups of students. Uh, and we've streamed those performances. Um, so that's the, that is the, uh, the mode for, it was the mode for fall, will be the mode again in uh, early May uh, mm -hmm. as we do the end of the semester ensemble performances. Uh, SU Dance Company, same story. Uh, again, that will be available uh, streaming online. But they've uh, still been, they're still performing and... and they are. They Practicing are. And, yes. Yeah. Yes. And doing what they can do mm -hmm. again with working with the restrictions that are in place. So now access to this, uh, the staff, I guess the faculty um, at Fulton Hall um, is not just available to the students. I understand that they take their expertise and make it available through what is called the Fulton Faculty Colloquia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. What does that mean? All right, so the, this is a Tuesday afternoon series that um, allows faculty to share what they've been working on in terms of research or creative activity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it kind of goes off of a, an expectation that faculty who return from sabbatical have the opportunity to share with their colleagues in the wider community uh, what they've been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a great opportunity to um, Get, get your ideas out in front of a group of people for a kind of informal kind of peer review and people can ask questions mm. and they can see all the different cool things that people have been up to while they've been on sabbatical. It's not specifically or only for people who've been on sabbatical, but it's an opportunity to, to, uh, to share that research more broadly so that it's not just esoteric and rarefied and uh, headed off for peer reviewed journals, but something that really enhances the community uh, really enhances their classroom instruction as well. Do they share well. just amongst the faculty or do they share with community involvement? Or? 
uh, community members are, are, welcome are welcome to join us. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Uh-huh. And so that's uh, all on the website. Uh, we, we post those um, uh, offerings in Panorama. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there will be a Panorama deadline coming up in May. And so everyone is getting ready for fall to the degree that we can, kind of mm-hmm. assuming that we'll be back face to face. So we will have uh, Chris e- Dr. Chris Egan, who is the Associate Dean of the Fulton School, uh, coordinates that series. And I think the, the slots are already filling up. So a lot of people have some great stuff to share. And uh, those events happen 3.30 on Tuesday afternoons. And every so, Tuesday? Not every Tuesday, but uh, once or twice a month. Okay. Yep. Uh, we kind of schedule them around the faculty senate meetings. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's uh, the, the, the public is welcome. Oh, that's interesting. Now, also with regard to the faculty, I know that you uh, present in the interdisciplinary lecture series. Mm-hmm. Um, this year, the topic was climate change and COVID-19. Um, what are the goals of, of the series? Yeah, so that I'm really proud of that series. Uh, that is yet another way that we, as a public university, can uh, get what our faculty are working on out uh, to the public and invite the public to... To, to hear what they have to say. Mm-hmm. And so that series typically runs Monday evenings and uh, it features a different speaker every week uh, on a theme. So this semester, appropriately enough, we've got um, a, a series that focuses on the impact of COVID in terms of everything else. And so we've talked about the pandemic and everybody understands that COVID was everywhere. And right. so it, that definitely was a pandemic. But it also kind of creates an opportunity to think about other issues that are sort of global in scope or at least widespread and and certainly related to this. So you think about uh, the impacts of COVID and and, uh, inequalities in society and uh, the effects of climate change, and all of those things are very much intertwined. Uh, So we think of this as a great opportunity to to just really kind of open up our minds and think about what's going on. Um, Students can participate in these courses for credit. They're one credit courses. We especially would love to see more high school students um, because it's a Monday evening. You you maybe get a little restless there as a junior or senior in high school. (laughs) Let's see what college is like, right? That's a great idea. Yep, open up that world. and, And again, it's never about kind of preaching uh, or advocating per se, although advocacy, we hope people will get excited about mm-hmm. things and, and, and um, become advocates for the issues they really care about. But this is really about opening up their minds to thinking about the complexities of problems and how, how intertwined they are and how the perspectives from different disciplines really are important to understanding those problems. That's, that's great. I, I think that you ought to find some way to invite those college, I mean, high school juniors and seniors to it. I don't know how you do that, but. Well, we're actually uh, really kind of opening up the whole idea of dual enrollment. Um, Dr. Mike Scott, my colleague in the Henson School, Mm -hmm. has really been a a leader in terms of working with the local schools to kind of illuminate the possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's always been out there as something that students could do, but there are a variety of obstacles for various reasons that aren't too interesting to explore here, (laughs) but uh, that have kind of stood in the way of that. But um, we're kind of opening that up. And this is a really great opportunity, I think, for students to sample. For students locally, especially, who might be feeling that kind of restless, I was, uh, restlessness I was talking about a second ago, realizing that the Salisbury University is connected, right, to the rest of the country, to the world, right. that there's a lot that happens here that, that they might not be really aware of until they get on campus mm-hmm. and kind of see what is all happening here and what the exciting uh, avenues to explore right here in Salisbury at Think of Salisbury University as your yeah. portal to the world, right? That's a great thought. And speaking of the world, I know that you had a special uh, January term project with India mm-hmm. uh, called Cast in India and the United States. How did that come about? Well, I, that is my favorite question. <laughs> <I've laughs> okay. all great questions so far. <laughs> But uh, in fact, I've just been on WhatsApp with my, uh, my fellow alums from a Fulbright Nero International Education Administrators Seminar mm-hmm. in India four years ago. Um, and so we, we, we spent time in three different major centers in India, uh, one of which was Ahmedabad, and we visited Pandit Dindayal, uh, then Petroleum University, now Energy University in uh, the Ahmedabad area. And uh, we've been working on a partnership with that institution ever since. 
And uh, so this past fall, we, I was in touch with Ritu Sharma, who's a pres professor of psychology and the dean uh, over there. And uh, we talked about doing some kind of collaboration because it was the pandemic mm -hmm. and we were connected online anyway. Was there a way for us to, to work together on a project? And Isabel Wilkerson's book had just come out and it was called Cast. And Cast certainly made me think about India. Who wouldn't, sure. right? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, two professors in psychology, Michelle Schlehofer and Rachel Steele, uh, stepped up and we worked with uh, the new chair of the department there, Dr. Meredith Patterson, and then our partners in India, foremost among whom uh, Ritu Sharma, to set up a Jan term course where we'd have groups of students in Amer in US and in India reading the book together. That's um, fascinating, really, to think about. Um, you, you got kids in India and kids here, all talking about their experiences and I and we have a lot to learn from it from one another that's that's a fabulous opportunity right right and and even uh, as we were planning for that thinking about how uh, different cultures have responded to the pandemic right and way yeah. things we can learn about each other in terms right. of why things went well in one place and maybe not as well elsewhere what we can learn from each other mm -hmm. and recognizing that we are a global community um, even if something like the pandemic sort of forces that realization upon us in a way that, of course, was was in many ways tragic. Yeah, but eye-opening. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Institute for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement has been another big connection to the community. Tell us a little bit about what PACE does. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to give a big shout out to PACE for really kind of leading the charge in terms of getting Salisbury University recognized mm -hmm. as a community engaged campus. It's a Carnegie classification. It's mm -hmm. a national kind of distinction. Uh, and PACE really does outstanding work and really innovative work when it comes to connecting our students and our curriculum to the wider community. Uh, we have a civic reflection program that's very exciting, and um, again, I would I would invite viewers to to watch for the panorama to look for programming around that mm -hmm. this fall. We of course want to have public facing programming again, where the public is invited, and we can have gatherings in the assembly hall of the uh, academic commons uh, for that kind of programming. But the idea is really to illuminate issues of public concern in ways that are uh, are. Um, I would, I don't, I, well, I would want to say cerebral, but cerebral in a good way, right? That we really get uh, really intelligent programming in front of people to mm -hmm. kind of get us to understand or give us tools to understand the problems that face us as a society. More specifically, uh, this, this spring we did a series, which was just amazing. Uh, we had an alum who was a great, great um, admirer of, so appreciative of the work that he had done with Harry Basehart as a student here uh, years ago. Uh, and is now a um, political campaign organizer in, in D.C. And so the series was uh, The Art and Science of Running for Public Office. So it really gave students the tools. Uh, it's kind of a mini course, really, in how to run for public office. So how do you understand, how do you work with social media? How do you fundraise? How do you get organized? What are the steps? What do you do when? Just a mind-blowingly amazing series for any student who just, what if I want to run for public office sometime? Right. Um, Is it just students that attend this? No, no, no. It was, again, open to the public. Oh, that's great. And we had participation from across the state and I think even out of state um, people. And it was all online, of course, because it was this spring. Mm -hmm. We're excited about doing something um, like that again, uh, maybe next as soon as next year. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd want to say with respect to PACE is that uh, the Sarbanes Lecture Series is back. Uh, that was a series that was started initially when Senator Paul Sarbanes, of course, who has since passed, mm -hmm. uh, was in his last term in the Senate. And he was able to uh, help us bring to campus um, uh, Congress, uh, members of Congress who, and senators uh, especially um, to talk about serving their country mm -hmm. through, uh, through Congress, which, again, is something that's really important for us to wrap our minds around. It's very easy to be cynical right about politics these days and yet it takes we hope uh, a certain degree of idealism and commitment to the common good uh, to get people to run for uh, run for office and then mm -hmm. serve uh, and so that series years ago brought and it was we were very uh, intentional about ensuring that that was bipartisan right mm -hmm. that we had senator richard luger for example at the same time that we had uh before she was speaker nancy pelosi mm -hmm. um and um so that series 
uh, hasn't really done much lately, but it's been ba it's back now that uh, Sen the Senator Sarbanes has passed. We brought it back this uh, spring. Martin O'Malley, uh, our former governor, mm -hmm. uh, spoke, uh, it, and it was an online session. But in memory of Senator Sarbanes, it's our goal to uh, to revive the series and to ensure that it gets back to its uh, instated uh, in original purpose of uh, bringing these public figures to campus to talk about the work I, that I they do. I think that, that's wonderful that you're doing that. Um, I know for you, one of the exciting things coming up is the Summer Enrichment Academy um, that brings younger students onto the campus. Again, we talked about that earlier, but uh, even younger than juniors and seniors, right? It, kids in elementary school, is that, how does that work? Yeah, so our, our, our focus for that series is actually high school student oh, population. School. Okay. Although we have the uh, innovation academies that work mainly with middle school students. Okay. And um, so, uh, and, and kind of working, because I have a little uh, in as far as the um, Summer Scholars Program over at Warwick Community College, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of staying out of each other's uh, space in terms of offering programming to students mm -hmm. um, with an eye, I, again, to getting them on the college campus and really experiencing the community that comes through these, these very kind of intimate gatherings of students and faculty. Uh, small groups working. All subject matters? Or? Mainly the arts, Mainly, although okay. um, uh, d definitely humanities as well. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Christina Camerano, who does outstanding work, actually with elementary school students as well, in uh, philosophy in schools. That is a really, huh. really lovely program. You get little kids, like uh, second graders, talking about if dreams are real, uh -huh. uh, which isn't just about sort of you know letting their minds run free, although there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but, but really sort of getting them to think about thinking, right? And how do they know things? Uh, it's, it's really, really lovely. And so that is actually part of our Summer Enrichment Academy this summer. Uh, the, I would say the, the emphasis and the focus is primarily on the arts, the visual and performing arts. And we had hoped to do that last summer. That was almost entirely scotched because of the, the pandemic, although we did do a dance, a virtual dance academy, if you can wow. get, 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 <laughs> You sit in your that. bedroom? And <laughs> well, they, actually, kinda. yes, yes, <laughs> that was literally the case uh, in, some, in some, exam, uh, some examples. But uh, this summer, uh, dance will be back, um, theater, uh, I think both on the acting and on the production side, uh -huh. uh, lots of different stuff with music, the visual arts, as I mentioned, philosophy. So we really have a wide range of opportunities. That's going to be uh, uh, available on our website soon for any parents who are interested, who might just be interested in getting their high school um, students, children uh, out of the house, you think? Yeah, I think. <laughs> in July. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the academies represent a real opportunity to have some of that activity again mm -hmm. uh, and to really help out those uh, high school students in particular, but middle school students for the Innovation Academy to literally get out of the house and and mm -hmm. do the kind of stuff that, that really kind of helps them move forward. I would think the arts would be the one area that has really suffered in, in education because it is really hard to do that virtually. Yep. I, I would think. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and again, our, 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 I want to talk a little bit about our visual artists have done amazing work um, virtually. Jinchil Kim, terrific artist, yes, uh, painter. Uh, course developed a way to kind of hone in on student work and being able to get them to get the camera to hone in on it so really kind of made instruction oh, that's very yeah. cool in terms of, of doing that individual mentoring and honing mm -hmm. in on aspects of their work and, uh, and from afar kind of, from afar using yeah. the camera to uh, that's fascinating yeah yeah, yeah absolutely huh. how can they get more involved where do they go our website, mm -hmm. um, and again, Dr. Chris Egan, who is a colleague from the Department of Communication, uh, has really been working hard in the last year to update our website. Uh, Panorama is is a good resource. It's a great publication. Yes, I keep beautiful. it on my coffee table all the time. Me too. Me too. And and it gets it gets updated. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to make that more sort of interactive online. But uh, the SU webpage. Uh, really should be the home away from home for any upcoming activities. Mm -hmm. Just about everything uh, is open to the public. Uh, I would want to mention as well uh, the Fulton Public Humanities Program. Uh, we've talked a lot about the arts, uh, but I'm a historian myself, oops, sorry, board, of mem board member of Maryland uh, Humanities, uh -huh. uh, which really looks to 
connect the humanities, which we think about as academic disciplines, history, literary studies, philosophy, modern languages, uh, to sort of reconnect them with the essential sort of human activity that's associated with those things. Mm -hmm. Everybody cares about their stories, right? right? People love stories. People think about the past. You think about how your experience has shaped who you are. You think about what things mean. And so public humanities really sort of aims to connect and reconnect scholars with the wider public. And what more appropriate place to do that than a public university that is also a community engaged campus. So lots and lots of programming and, and really the heartbreaking thing about the last year has been the fact that people can't come to campus. Uh, we're really, really excited about opening our doors again and welcoming the public to Salisbury University's beautiful campus. And believe and, me, the public is ready to come. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the beautiful things that happen inside yes. those halls. Well, you've told us about a lot of them, and I really appreciate all the hard work and flexibility and outside-the-box thinking that your faculty and staff has done to make this work this last year. So well, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Martin. Sure. SU is a great option for students looking to expand their horizons and a great partner to the community. Let's take a look at some of the other ways Salisbury University excels. Salisbury University opens doors for every student who wants to succeed. A proud member of the University System of Maryland, we are committed to increasing affordability and access to higher education in Maryland. As a public institution, we create opportunities to improve lives and communities across the state and beyond. And by supporting our regional economy, we lift everyone in Maryland a little bit higher. SU consistently ranks among the nation's best colleges by the Princeton Review, US News and World Report, Money, Forbes, and others. Students rave about our Guerrero Academic Commons, which is ranked as one of the top 20 university libraries in the country. Our online graduate programs in business and nursing are highly ranked, and with many student-led initiatives, we are a national leader in sustainability. All SU students have the opportunity to take inspiration beyond the classroom, engaging in research and scholarship as undergraduates. SU has been named by the State Department as a top producer of Fulbright students for the past four years. More than 60 students have won national and international fellowships and awards in recent years. Expert faculty mentors help students amplify their strengths and their goals. SU offers over 60 undergraduate majors, master's degrees, and doctoral programs. We provide a high quality education at an affordable price for more than 8,000 students and their families. For more than a decade, we've been recognized as a best value among public colleges. We are responsible stewards of student tuition dollars, Maryland taxpayer dollars, and private support, including generous gifts for five endowed colleges and schools. Engagement and outreach are central to the SU experience. Our regional GIS cooperative, literacy center, award-winning public school partnerships, research center for Delmarva history, and cutting-edge medical simulation center all serve our area and provide experiential learning for our students. We also are home to an Institute for Civic Engagement and the Business, Economic, and Community Outreach Network, Beacon. In 2020, SU received external grants and contracts totaling over $6.2 million for efforts including college and career readiness, opioid-impacted family support, nursing shortages, and scientific research. SU provides an excellent education right here in Maryland, where more than 37,000 alumni have stayed to invest in their state. Graduates contribute to Maryland's workforce as teachers, nurses, civil servants, corporate leaders, and entrepreneurs. We proudly salute over 1,300 alumni business owners. We partner and develop the next generation of talent on the Eastern Shore, including through our Mid-Atlantic Sales and Marketing Institute, our entrepreneurship competitions, and new Rommel Center for Entrepreneurship in downtown Salisbury help create startups and jobs. SU itself is one of Wacomico County's largest employers, and our regional economic impact is approximately $600 million annually. Diversity and inclusion are at the forefront of Salisbury University initiatives, as we ensure our curriculum helps students confront inequality and promote equity. With dedicated faculty and staff, 
and our Center for Equity, Justice, and Inclusion, we are working to inspire a campus culture that serves as a model for inclusive excellence. We prepare students for life and leadership in an interconnected world. Salisbury University is helping Maryland rank nationally for its educated workforce, advancing racial equity and social justice, driving innovation statewide, and expanding access to excellent, affordable education. SU is one of the best investments you can make in Maryland's future. We heard from Dr. Paraboom about all the ways that SU and the Fulton School continue to interact with the community. Let's take a look at some of the virtual campus events open to all in April.
As Dr. Paraboom said, SU students, faculty, and staff can't wait to be back in person with you at events on campus. But it's great to see so many opportunities are still available to all who want to be involved. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Martin Paraboom, Dean of the Charles R. and Martha N. Fulton School of Liberal Arts. I'm Susan Purnell. This has been Salisbury University On the Air. Thank you for watching.